So I wonder if we could put if we if we could put up okay. yeah we could put up these screens.
it's more, well, can I see what it is that people are seeing? Okay, so yeah, that's green. Yeah. Well, uh, so we'll 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 so and then we're now, we have this part. Yeah, at least, okay, it's like, 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 Because it's only on the podium. But when I zoom out, right? Should I just not have them in the front? Yeah, yeah. There's a way you can have. I could. Okay, you'll just you'll hear her um, audio until you see her, and then when she gets to the middle part, is when she'll enter rather than so. so exactly.
mm -hmm. and myself. Um, we'd like to welcome you here tonight, those of you in person. It is amazing to finally be uh, in person. We've had two years of virtual programming, um, and to our virtual audience that is still live streaming in from all parts of the world, like we just love y'all. Y'all don't pay attention to time zones, time differences. <laughs> Um, you really show up for us as a global center, and we appreciate that. Um, I am not going to read my bio credentials because y'all don't know that. Uh, we are so pleased this evening to announce that this event starts, this event and last night's event at the Schomburg uh, with uh, Dr. with Patricia Hersey, um, begins an exciting for us, titled The Black Breast Project. And tonight, the presentation of an international award-winning journalist, former CBBC distinguished activist in residence, and self-proclaimed global black chick. <laughs> um, and my sister, uh, Esther Amos, New School of Emotional Justice, a roadmap for racial healing, features a dramatized And this light means that we are on. Okay, can you ask them if they can hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Tonight, we are delighted to have Esther A. Arma in the house, the CEO of the Arma Institute of Emotional Justice, the AIEJ, a global institute working across Accra, New York, and London. Emotional justice is a visionary roadmap for racial healing. The AE the AIEJ devises, develops, designs, and delivers projects, training and thought leadership, and engages storytelling as a strategy for structural change. Esther is an international award-winning journalist, a playwright, an international speaker, and an author. As a journalist, she has worked in London, New York, Chicago, Washington, DC, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa. She was the spring 2022 distinguished active act Distinguished Activist in Residence at NYU CBBC, that's us. Her emotional justice essays are featured in the New York Times bestselling book, 400 Souls, a community history of African, African American, of African, Amer African America, sorry. The award-winning Love with Accountability and Charleston Syllabus. She has written five emotional justice plays that have been produced and performed in New York, Chicago, and Ghana. For her emotional justice work, she won the Community Healer Award 
at the 2016 Valuing Black Lives Global Emotional Emancipation Summit in Washington, D.C. Esther was named Most Valuable New York Radio Host in the nation's 2000, 2012 Progressive Honors List for her work on Wake Up Call on Pacificus WBAI, and she was named one of African, Africa's, women lead, Africa's Women Leaders in the 2019 World Women Leadership Conference Awards by CMO Asia and the Africa Leadership Academy. Joining Esther on stage is actress Beverly Prentice, a native of Cardiff, UK, graduate of the Laban Center for Movement and Dance in London. She's honored to work again with Esther Alma. Her, their previous projects included Can I Be Me and Forgive Me. She has enjoyed a dynamic career traveling internationally. Other theater credits include Sylvia Fighting Fires, Salome Salome, uh, Sheila, oh, the Sheila. I think I'm saying that right. Darker Face of the Earth, Hortensio, Taming of the Shrew, Antigone, The Oedipus Plays, Athens Festival in Greece, Portia, Julius Caesar, Julio, Famed, Courtesans. Y'all have done a lot, a whole lot. Um, amid a global racial reckoning, Esther Arma's book offers a much needed language for racial healing and repair. Arma is the creator of Emotional Justice, a framework for racial healing shaped by her time as a journalist in South Africa, Ghana, London, and New York. In her new book, Arma explains our historical racial healing model centers whiteness and therefore cannot serve our humanity. Arma introduces a new model that identifies our emotional work and requires that we unlearn and dismantle the language of whiteness. Arma explains that dismantling the language of whiteness requires different work from different people. The book looks at key terms, intimate reckoning, intimate revolution, resistance, negotiation and revolutionary black race that enable people to challenge white supremacy. Intimate reckoning shows white women how they can examine their role in sustaining white supremacy, while intimate revolution teaches black women to unknown the language of whiteness that teaches them their sole value is labor. As mentioned, this event kicks off the Black Rest Project, and for the next three years, the CBBC commits to making black rest visible by asking, what does black rest look like and what will it take to get there? Using Hersey's liberatory framework of rest as resistance as inspiration, the CBBC commits to making not black rest not only visible, visible but exploring rep reparative justice and healing through the exploration of rest as a revolutionary act. Black people's collective exhaustion is not an acceptable byproduct of black life or struggle, but rather a crisis of depletion that threatens every aspect of our goals and well-being, including social justice. The Black Rest Project aims to push past the walls of academia and support healing in diverse spaces and forums through strategic partnership with visionary scholars, cultural workers, artists, and community, community organizations. The BRP will excavate, curate, and amplify both visual narratives of black press and leisure to create meaningful discourse. We ask, what does black press look like? What are the necessary disruptions and interventions in our institutions, artistic and scholarly praxis that must happen in order to make black press possible? How do we eradicate the lingering feelings of guilt, projected laziness, shame, and worthlessness that often impede black press? And as America undergoes the great resignation, and it reevaluates its relationship to work, we subject this moment to a deliberately diasporic, black, brown, queer, and immigrant lens. Finally, please follow the CBBC on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at NYUCBBC. And come to our upcoming events this semester. All of our live events will be live streamed as well. So thank you again for joining us in person and to our virtual audience. You can find more about our events on our website, which is nyuiaa.org. So coming up later this month, quickly, our next event will be October 24th. It's called Comrade Sisters in a Time of Panthers, Early Photographs, which is a celebration of the publication of two books 
focusing on the Black Panther Party with Erica Huggins, Stephen Shame, Jeffrey Henson Scales, and Regina Jennings. It's a collaboration between us and WNYC's The Green Space. In November, on this November 16th, the Black West Project presents Joshua Rashad McFadden, I Believe I'll Run, in conversation with artists and professor here, Lyle Ashton Harris. And in December, our distinguished writer, community activist in residence for the fall semester, Nadege Green, will do her public lecture. So now, without further ado, please welcome me, and please join me in, welcome, in welcoming Esther Arma and Beverly Prentice. Soldiers in battle fatigues, black boots stomping, breaking down our front door and ransacking our home. Oh, they smash all the windows, break covers, turn out drawers, they put a gun. One night is followed by 730 days of house arrest. Two years. Two years. Soldiers in battle fatigues become part of our home. I have no memory of that night or the following 730 days. I have memory, though. For over 20 years, I'm <coughs> haunted by them. 3 a.m. Three in the morning, I'm dragged awake. I hear black boots stomping around in my head. I lash out, I'm, I'm screaming, I'm silent. I'm drenched in fear-stained sweat. I'm awake. Oh. The night terrors just keep coming. In the I don't know what the nightmares are. Until, until now. Now is March 1997. Now is Mars' broken silence. Now is the filling in of a gap. 1997, <laughs> I am grown, well, very young, thank you very much. A very young journalist, I'm in Ghana. I cover 40 years of independence from British colonial rule. <laughs> My dad. My dad is here telling stories from that time. <laughs> Pop. <laughs> Three piece suits. And, oh, the softest hair and the biggest smile. <laughs> he was an activist in pre independence Ghana, a fierce pan Africanist with equally fierce sideburns. He went on to become a diplomat and 
a minister serving in Ghana's first post-independence government under President Kwame Nkrumah. But it is Ma that rocks me and changes my path and sets a foundation that becomes emotional justice. Ma, <laughs> tribe and faith, proudly Christian and fiercely Ashanti. <laughs> Ma's just broken her 20 plus years silence about Ghana's first military coup in February 1966. She's just told me that it was her and my sisters, me included, that faced the tanks, the soldiers, the guns, and the violence. She's just told me about the nights the tanks came. Broken silence. When my mother broke her silence, it was a discovery for me. A discovery about naming what is hidden and how the power of what is hidden can shape you in ways you cannot understand until what is hidden is both named and put into context. It is in that naming and contextualizing that I begin to understand, to think about myself as an emotional human being outside of profession and education, I learn you cannot PhD yourself out of trauma. Trauma, untreated, unnamed, but present, not just in me, but in us, us global black people, a trauma that's about more than just a date in Ghana's history, but sits on a history of oppressive human systems. How does that untreated trauma shape how we see ourselves, how we love, how we move? Questions. Ooh, this trip created a series of questions that would turn into a roadmap, but it would take another two journeys to name it. Time to go. I leave Ghana, go back to London, and then from London, I hit the road again off to Philadelphia. Philly. October 1997. <laughs> I've never been, actually. I've never been to the States at that point. My first time. I lose my American virginity to Philadelphia. <laughs> the earth did not move. <laughs> I'm here to cover the October 1997 Million Woman March. I meet Winnie Mandela, the march's keynote speaker. I stay with a nice white liberal woman who has kindly opened up her home to black women traveling to Philadelphia for the march. Her home is large and there are other nice white liberal folks. They rent rooms from her. She and they are deeply upset about the choice of Winnie Mandela as keynote speaker. There are multiple conversations about their concern. I'm struck 
by how angry they are. And I'm equally struck by how much they think their anger should be considered. Oh, no, wrong word, not considered. Centered. Centered. By black women at an event that is about black women. This is where I really notice how whiteness centers itself, expects the emotions of white people to not just be acknowledged, but centered and acted on, overrided how those emotions impact a black woman in something that matters to that black woman. My nice white liberal woman host asked me one question again and again. What are you doing here? I'm puzzled. I'm puzzled of those. In my head, I'm like, didn't you just open up your home for black women? And ain't I a black woman? Just again and again and again, clearly, there's an issue. Eventually, I ask, is there an issue? Oh, no, 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 she says. No, no issue. Shh. <laughs> Immediately defensive. She then shushes me, and I'm more surprised than annoyed. I end up meeting her dad, who, it turns out, is a real-life missionary from Ghana. No way, right? Huh? Way. He asked me the same question his daughter asks. What are you doing here? <laughs> what is up with you people? I think to myself, but I don't say that. He elaborate, elaborates. Um, my daughter told me your family is uh, from Ghana, uh, from Africa, and that you were born and went to school in, uh, in Britain. Weird, I thought. Oh. I explain again that I'm a journalist covering the march and in need of accommodation, that I am black, black British, and that yes, my family is from Ghana. Father and daughter exchange looks. Weird, I thought. Discomfort hangs in the air, it, it just lingers, so weird. Then, the penny drops to him and to her. I don't look like I need help. To them, I don't look like a needy black woman. I don't look wretched and I don't seem poor. Oh, sometimes, oh, white people just be white people in. <laughs> Ludicrous, I think. But leads me to a realization. Their relationship to blackness, particularly one that derived from Africa, is about a certain wretchedness, an inability, a body needing saving. Hmm, I don't fit that narrative. For me, there's a context here. This is about the emotional power of the language of whiteness as a narrative of how the world is. Our place in it as white and black people and how that language shapes how we see each other. I'm at Philadelphia's Aikens Oval. It's a historical site of slave auctions and the Million Woman March stage. It is where Winnie Mandela delivers her keynote speech to thousands and thousands of women, stretched from 
Benjamin Franklin Parkway right down to Penn's Landing and spilling over to City Hall. Mama Winnie, <laughs> that's what she's affectionately called across South Africa and by black folks globally. I share with Mama Winnie about Ma's broken silence and the night the tanks came. I tell her I am to he I'm heading to her home nation of South Africa to engage the global narrative on, and conversation on forgiveness as part of an assignment on the globally renowned Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Mama Winnie reminds me that as I travel in South Africa, I need to center my mother's broken silence and to think more deeply about what she endured. She reminds me to connect my silence as a black woman in thinking through and exploring forgiveness by black women, black people, of white racist violence. That begins a journey to center black women in understanding how a nation's narrative is shaped, whom it centers and whom it excludes, and how that exclusion shapes the story of who they are as a people. This assignment, meeting and speaking with Mama Winnie, <laughs> the exchanges with the nice white liberal woman and her dad, it was a consciousness raising moment. I hadn't thought deeply about gender and whiteness before. I hadn't really thought critically about gender and healing until then either. I was beginning to. It is November 1997. South Africa. I I'm here, the land of Madiba. <laughs> oh, I'm here to report on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC, the body set up following South Africa's first democratic elections in 1994. The commission's focus, tell the full truth about the atrocities you committed during apartheid, and in return, you get amnesty and forgiveness. Hmm. I meet and I interview Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the commission's architect and an anti-apartheid warrior, and Entesiki Biko, the widow of Steve Biko, a beloved figure known as South Africa's father of black consciousness. I watch this wrenching truth-telling process of an outpouring of black trauma against white legislated violence. It is here that I explore and develop this term, the language of whiteness, and name two of its pillars, emotional patriarchy and racialized emotionality. These first two pillars become integral parts of unlearning this language of whiteness, a deadly lie of a narrative that says white people built the world, saved the world, and civilized the world. 
and black people are savages needing saving and civilizing. A pivotal encounter leads me to this naming after listening to Entaziki Biko and what happened to her husband. I'm ushered into Archbishop Tutu's office in Cape Town. He prays before our interview. I ask him about this process of forgiveness between black and white people. South Africa will be a mecca for whites, just like Kenya, declares Tutu. I ask him why there's so much focus on how white people feel. His answer is evasive. I ask again and again. I ask why there is so much focus on how white people feel in a nation healing from so much horror and harm perpetrated against black bodies by a system that enshrined the false superiority of whiteness. He gets uncomfortable and then angry. He tells me that when it comes to repair, black South Africans shouldn't ask for too much. I ask him what too much means, given the extent, weight, and depth of pain caused to black South Africans and their families. He goes on to explain that if someone needs particular assistance, say a wheelchair, uh, because of apartheid violence, then that person could get that. The TRC would find someone to help them with that. I'm struck by how limited the language of repair is, but also how individual it is. Even though the TRC body is about forgiving an entire people, <laughs> the repair seems to be about forgetting that an entire people had been subject to apartheid. I continue to ask about black people's needs and their healing. I leave with a sharpened focus on this centralizing and soothing of whiteness and a neglect of blackness. What was Tutu and Mandela asking South Africa to forget? To forgive the laws enshrining false notions of white superiority and black inferiority? Laws like the urban areas of 1923 that created what became exclusive African slums. The 1926 Color Bar Act that banned Africans from practicing skilled trades and forced a poverty that black South Africans continue to struggle with today. The 1936 Representation of Natives Act, which removed black voters from the voters' roll in Cape Town, essentially denouncing their citizenhood. What Mandela was asking to let pass was the water cannons, the truncheons, the torture and the killing uh, of the killing and terrorizing of children, robbing them of their innocence, their childhood, making violence their normal. There was the killing and raping of women, the, the murder of men's souls, the murder of men's bodies. There was the emasculation of black men, the humiliation of black women, the wholesale thievery of land, 
There was racializing and dehumanizing black bodies and then targeting them with ongoing violence. Forgiveness took on a color, a context, a direction, and a meaning. Apartheid was terrorism and white supremacy. Forgiveness was black emotional labor, and it was absolution for whiteness. It was a one and done healing scenario. It did not account for legacy and didn't center those who had been harmed and what was necessary for their healing. That meant white people did no emotional work, but received amnesty and forgiveness. Because of this moment, this realization, I coined the term racialized emotionality, describing a world where where we racialize emotions, where we insert color, context, and consequence to emotions. Doing that changes how we see those bodies. Racialized bodies becomes targets of violence. Years later, I connect this history of racial healing, of emotional labor by black folk in service of white supremacist violence to the US and the UK. South Africa's racial healing model is emulated and lauded by countries all over the world. The truth is, it wasn't meant for black folks. And the breadth and the depth of the harm, the toll and the legacy of that harm on them, their communities. No national conversation that said to black men, forgive yourselves for who you might have become to survive. No national conversation that said to black women, forgive yourselves for, for what you endured. No national conversation about black men and black women together forgiving each other for how apartheid shaped them, how they loved, how they hated how they became broken, the self-hate that might have been triggered, and the toll of eternally fighting to breathe and to be. The toll that took on their sense of self. No. Because of that, this was not a a roadmap for racial healing. No, it was a model that privileges one group and exacts emotional labor from another. It was political, it was structural, and it was inequitable. It was an unfinished journey. One of the most oh, powerful examples is in the treatment of Winnie Mandela. Mama Winnie. South African writer Sesonke M. Simang wrote, this was a nation with a narrative of forgiveness, but it would not forgive Winnie Mandela. There was public humiliation and global castigation of a black woman, woman, while de Klerk, a white man who presided over a white government, got a peace prize, a stage, and global acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. 
from physical labor to emotional labor by black people in service of whiteness. This was emotional injustice. And in this time, we cannot take that approach, not if we really want a racial healing that serves a full humanity. And to Siki Biko said, there is a lot of talk about reconciliation. What I want is for the proper course of justice to be done. Listening to Mrs. Biko's call for a justice, even when connected to a process that was deeply emotional, I begin to think more structurally about the emotionality of blackness. We need a new racial healing model. One that learned lessons from South Africa and Kenya and evolved to honor where we are now. Emotional justice was named and born. And then I would come here to New York and strengthen and shape and build and grow emotional justice in community and creativity. Emotional justice, a roadmap to racial healing. Y'all didn't hear me. <laughs> Emotional justice, a roadmap for racial healing, was born and named and grown. How does it work? How do you use it? Do you want to know? Do you really want to know? Do you? I don't hear you. Do you want to know? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 Well, buy the book. <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Emotional justice. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Hey, hey. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. Gotta get my frames on. See, the frames can't interrupt the flyer, they gotta accentuate it. You fix the hat right quick. <laughs> okay. I am a black woman who, like millions of us across the world, I've been taught to speak the language of whiteness. And despite a politics of fierce Pan-African, Pan-Africanism, inherited by my dad, of tribe, the Ashanti matrilineal tribe of my mother, a culture, an identity, a clarity, a history, I still speak the language of whiteness. That issue, is at the heart of how I developed emotional justice as a framework for racial healing. Asking the question, how do I speak the language of whiteness, is the beginning of a process of unlearning that very thing. We heard the breakdown of the language of whiteness as a narrative that teaches all of us how the world came to be and our place in it as black, brown, indigenous, white people. The challenge that we have is the sophistication of our politics, the eloquence of our political arguments, the clarity of our philosophy has created this false notion that those things connect directly to our emotionality. 
with emotional justice, I'm saying, nah, nah, son. Brooklyn voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just that it's not true, it's that it creates a cycle of progress and regress that is damaging us and that is creating this healing, this notion of healing that is really ideology masquerading as healing. It doesn't work, it, it will never work, and it is not designed to serve us or to shape us. I'm a black woman who speaks the language of whiteness. Unlearning it is a lifelong process of practicing rest. Why? The language of whiteness is so specifically about labor. Because emotional justice is a framework about not just emotions in the individual sense, but the emotional as structural, as shaping how our systems work and how they move. So that when we talk about labor and when we think about labor, historically, we have a specific relationship. What we actually need, though, is intimate revolution. I want you to check out this definition. It's from chapter four of my book. Intimate revolution is about the emotional work of changing black, brown, and indigenous women's relationship to labor and black men's relationship to masculinity. This emotional work for both black women and men is deeply complicated precisely because it is a relationship. The reason I talk about the language of whiteness and our relationship to blackness is because we understand that relationship is about intimacy. We're able to grasp the notion that this is not about a rational, intellectual space, but there is a power in the emotional that shapes how we move. Part of our work when it comes to racial healing because we all have work to do, but it's important to understand that that work is not the same if you're white, it's not the same if you're black, it's different if you're a woman, it's different if you're a man. Identifying that matters, because what the South African model has taught us is that there is one racial healing model that applies to this entire group of people, and using it leads us to racial healing. It doesn't. It entrenches white supremacy because it is a model that is about soothing and reassuring and affirming whiteness. More painful than that, and what is important to say but hard to hear, is I remember being in South Africa and watching the men of the movement be affirmed and uplifted by a global white media that revered their willingness to encourage black emotional labor in service of whiteness. You cannot heal your masculinity by standing on the backs of global black people. It is not found there, but it's what happens when you have a racial healing model that's about centering and prioritizing and privileging whiteness. So what does that mean? The language of whiteness creates a relationship to labor that has always been about inequity. We're sitting in New York. We are sitting in the United States of America, a nation built on enslavement. Its origins were about free labor exacted by black people for and in service to whiteness and white people. So what does that mean? It means that we have to do what? Redefine our relationship to labor. What does that mean for global black people? The challenge that we have is labor is never just work. I'm not talking about a nine to five, I'm not talking about a job. I'm talking about a relationship to productivity that is life, death, breath, strength, all the things. Every one of them challenging, painful, and difficult for black folk. It is about this celebration that looks at depletion, exhaustion, breaking down, broken down, unable to stand, and calls it success. It turns the hustle into a haven, and it makes harm a love language. That shit don't serve us, but it does, it does and has always served whiteness. 
So then if we're talking about emotional justice, justice and a racial healing model, what am I talking about? Institutionalizing wellness and stop speaking harm as if it's a love language. What does that look like? We have to explore this intersection between labor and history and race and gender and worth. Why? The language of whiteness is about our emotional relationship to power that centers whiteness, no matter how blackety black black our politics may be. And they often are. But the fact of that political clarity, those, those roots that are rooted in the most powerful of culture, doesn't change how whiteness has told all of us this and, and created this um, narrative of this deadly delusion of white superiority and black inferiority. And we buy it and we believe it. We refute it ideologically. We reject it politically. We fight against it in terms of our justice movements. We do all the things. I'm not talking about the reality of a history that has demonstrated that black people have always fought against the drumbeat that is white supremacy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an emotional relationship to labor, which is how the language of whiteness manifests in our bodies. Specifically, I'm talking about what does that look like when it comes to emotional labor? The reason why it's so crucial to break down how emotional labor becomes what I call emotional grind is if we do not establish how clearly emotional labor is structurally contributing to upholding inequitable systems. We'll keep thinking that if we just make better arguments, we'll get to freedom. We don't, we won't, we can't, it hasn't happened, we've tried. It creates a cycle of, of regress and progress and progress and regress. We take three steps forward, there's a massive backlash, we're flung all the way back. It's not a question of our politics, good, bad, or indifferent. I ain't saying politics don't matter, don't misquote me now. <laughs> I am saying that the, em the emotional politics of power and blackness and labor have a much more integral role in how we sustain a path that has nothing to do with our healing. That journey takes us from labor all the way to grind. Labor historically, we know that we're standing on um, land where black bodies were enslaved, that they were property. And we know that there is a history of movements fighting to liberate us from a labor, an extracted labor that treated our bodies as property. We know that we are freedom fighters. American, African-American, Caribbean, in Brazil, wherever in the world you go, black people have fought for their freedom. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the reality of the toll of a relationship to labor that only measured you according to how much more you could do, how little you rested, mm -hmm. how much more you could take on, that that labor in service of whiteness would and could and did literally kill you. But it also created a relationship to labor where you value yourself solely according to your productivity. The language of whiteness is a narrative. It's not like it ain't French. It's not bonjour, how are we doing? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking and the narrative that shapes how you move, how you see yourself when you look in the mirror, the kind of relationship you create to your blackness, not just in your body, but in the people that you encounter in different parts of the space. That physical labor, that disparity, then creates this emotional relationship where your worth and your productivity are in a monogamous union. Committed, no divorce. How do we know that? Because we may articulate a need for rest and replenishment, but we practice a devotion to grind. And we see it as gangster and glorious. So we go from historical labor and the plantation, a liberation of that physically, but we have created an emotional relationship to labor that is part of the legacy of the untreated trauma that comes from the language of whiteness. Grind. This is a quote from the book. Grind, a generational inheritance passed down 
passed around and emerging from the bellies of black women the world over. It is toil always, rest never, reward rarely. We grind for good, we grind for God, we grind for men, we grind. No healing lies there. Part of the cancer of grind is that it's seductive because it's rewarded. We are affirmed. The sister who's like, I was up all night, I didn't stop, I kept going, keep pushing through, keep going. We have an entire language that affirms grind as the way to be and is how we define success. And then we can and do as black people we police each other's productivity. Mm -hmm. Worse, we police each other's rest. What do you mean you ain't doing nothing? You're just sitting on that couch? <laughs> that relationship to rest then centers guilt because you're talking about historical relationship to labor where the reward came from literally working yourself to death. That is a phrase that should have black, brown, indigenous people all beside it because that's our reality. And I speak as a, uh, a creative migrant, a creative immigrant. And in one of the trainings we do at the Institute, specifically with black, brown, um, indigenous women managers and leaders, we do this entire exchange where we just ask one question. Where did you learn grind? Where, from whom? because we're learning it in our communities, because it's part of the inheritance that is the legacy of untreated trauma that we haven't given enough language, clarity, specificity to. It is not a place of judgment. I speak as somebody who does it. So emotional justice is not a model that is a teaching space. It is an, it's a model of exchange and community that recognizes we are all in the space together. We're not necessarily doing the same things and we're not supposed to be doing the same thing, but we're all in it. There is no one and done 140 character length healing that has anything to do with what is good for black people's humanity. And so what South Africa taught me as somebody who's a student of racial healing models is that the language of whiteness is a cancer that seduces <laughs> particularly black men, because it affirms a traumatized masculinity that taught them to be a man is to be in dominion over something or somebody. And if you don't have that kind of dominion, what kind of man are you? And so what South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation offered those men was a chance to stand because the cancer of apartheid was about being small. I remember the first time I stepped off the plane in 1997 in Johannesburg, I was a journalist. And whenever you're doing a trip of that magnitude and the entire world was in South Africa, actors, celebrities, the entire global media from all over the world has descended on this one place. What nobody prepares you for in doing the research and going through the archive is that when you step onto South African so soil, stepping out of the airport, the apartheid is air. Like you literally feel like you're being choked goes into your body and I'm, I stand five foot 10 in my bare feet and you can feel yourself. You can feel your body shrinking into yourself because that is literally how the language of whiteness moves in that particular space. So this racial healing model, the historical one that was so affirmed particularly by um, um, black men, it allowed an unfurling of your body. It allowed you to stand. So I write in the book that I don't judge the racial healing model. I just reject its relevance for 2022. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that can serve us. But we're all shaped by white supremacy, but the shaping is not the same. And so the work that black men have to do is not the same work that black women have to do, but there's absolutely work that we have to do. So let's talk about it. So if I were to ask you the question that I said we ask in the training, what is your relationship to grind? Where did you learn it? Would you talk about immigrant families or communities? Would you talk about your mother or your grandmother or your grandparents? Would you talk about your community? Would you talk about what it means to balance and juggle and struggle just to make ends meet? 
Would you talk about what it means to know that if you stop or if you pause, things will break? What does it mean to say, well, if you stop or if you pause, things will break? Or more honestly, I don't even know how to stop. I don't know what stopping would look like. And then if I did, what would I do? Because even rest is never stillness, it's still activity. So what does that mean? So what is your relationship to grind? It's expected, it's required, it's desired, it's demanded, it's defended, depleted, disgusted, exhausted, rewarded, resented. It is a complicated relationship, but it's profoundly what shapes how we think about labor and ourselves when it comes to productivity. Part of the challenge is in our community, the way we love is so intimately connected to how much we're willing to grind, especially when it comes to black women in service of institutions, in service of emotional, pat emotional patriarchy, which is one of the languages of whiteness we have to unlearn, a system where we center men, <coughs> centrally white men, no matter the cost or consequence to all women and black and brown people. No healing lies there, but that's how the language of whiteness structures itself. From that grind culture that's been created, that we all work with and move, there's the emotional grind. There's the way that you feel about the fact that you have to grind, the fact that you don't know how to stop grinding, the fact that you feel rewarded by grinding, the fact that you feel guilty if you don't grind, the fact that you're in a community that will guilt you if you stop grinding, the fact that you yourself are so committed and connected to the grind that the idea of rest is like an alien notion. Literally, it's an alien notion. But we articulate, there's an entire industry around self-care, but the challenge is that the emotional relationship to grind has turned self-care into self-indulgence. And that notion that to care for yourself is an indulgence is part of the legacy of untreated trauma where labor was the only way you had value. So the idea of your rest was never about care, that it was about laziness. The legacy of those emotions create your relationship to grind. So if I rest, it's because I'm lazy. And we may do it in jest, we may do it with humor, but we're always reminding each other that we're not in productivity. You know, books, ble books blessed and busy, the three Bs? Well, you may not be blessed when you're busy. You may just be broken and being busy. And I speak as somebody who recognizes living in New York for a decade. I remember having a moment living here where I, it was literally all profile, no paycheck. Doing great things, could barely afford to make rent. Deeply in struggle. And fluent in the struggle, but emotionally illiterate. And we need to develop a liberation literacy that centers our emotionality as a global black people. Mm but it's a language we have to learn because we don't speak it. We speak labor fluently. We speak grind gloriously. Rest is like a whisper, it's like baby steps. We've got to learn it. So that emotional grind is about unlearning the language of whiteness and separating the notion that your care is about guilt and that your care is about laziness. And that that narrative isn't just one that stems from plantation um, from enslavement history, that it is weaponized in all the political campaigns in terms of how American politics functions. So that the scapegoats in political campaigns are so often black women and the narrative of the welfare queen, um, the person who's scamming, it's the idea of a laziness. So the narrative of labor and laziness sits in our bodies in very specific ways. And so part of the relationship to grind is consistently proving that you're not lazy and you're willing to work. Who are you proving it to and what is it that you're trying to prove? Even as we're breaking, depleted, exhausted. These past two years of COVID have devastated all of us in different ways. And the loneliness from being cut off from community has meant that the urgency of a racial healing model is elevated in a massive, massive way. There is a fierce urgency to racial healing but the nature of the structures that we move in, that we walk in, that we work in, treat it like it has all the time in the world. Why? Because it still moves to the rhythm of white supremacy. 
yeah. and keeps doing that. Emotional grinds can turn us into emotional mammies. So we know what a mammy is, right? We know the mammy is the um, dark-skinned, southern, typically large black woman who would take, her, take care of the white family. And she, had, she found joy and happiness and all the things, all the flavors in looking after a white family. That gave her everything that she needed. An emotional mammy is a black person, irrespective of size, hue, or what part of the world they're in, that privileges and caters to the feelings of white folk, no matter the cost or consequence to themselves. We are all trained to be emotional mammies because historically, when you did not center or understand the emotionality of whiteness, you could die. It wasn't like not understanding it was, was some kind of option. There was no opt out. You had to learn to navigate the emotions of white folk because that was your lifeline. But what is the legacy of doing that? The legacy of doing that is in all spaces. You, can, you internalize the navigating and the soothing and the affirming of whiteness, and we continue to do it. And there's a, there's a, uh, there's a cost if we don't, and there's a profit when we do. And that continues to be our particular reality. Emotional justice is saying one simple thing. We've got to unlearn the language of whiteness, and we've got to replace it with an emotional justice love language. We're talking specifically about intimate revolution because it's about a relationship to labor and transforming that. But it's recognizing that it is a lifelong journey to institutionalize wellness in our own lives and then specifically connect that to the structures and the institutions and the systems within which we work, which we learn, where we do leisure. That emotional justice is never about your individual action alone. It is connected to community, it's connected to structure, it's connected to system. Why? Because with emotional justice, I treat the emotional as structural. And the interconnection between individual and institutional is how we develop a racial healing that transforms systems. Understanding that if you do not transform the system and you're just dealing with individual behavior, you're actually simply rearranging the language of whiteness and still making it your reality. It's still your center. So what if we replaced the guilt that comes with the idea of rest with grace? That we need as a global black people, we need grace, specifically to and for ourselves and then extended to and for one another. So often we extend a grace to whiteness that we do not extend to one another or to ourselves as um, black, brown, and indigenous people. So often we extend a care to whiteness that we do not extend to ourselves or to one another. That is part of how we speak the language of whiteness and that's what I mean. What would it mean if grace was how you began your relationship with yourself when it comes to labor? And what does that mean? It means that you have to learn to say, I've had enough and I can't do anymore. And the cost of not doing any more is something that somebody's going to have to bear. But you don't rearrange an entire life, an entire world, an entire community activity in order to feed an institution that is not feeding your spirit, your emotionality or your healing. The language of whiteness stops being spoken when we choose a care that is not just individual, but that is institutional. Institutionalizing and centering care is a generations long reality. It's a project and it's a practice because we have no relationship to doing that. And it's so hard just to change it in your own actual life and then connect it to your work. Just the idea of going in and saying, okay, I'm gonna need this time off. I remember having this conversation with this, um, we do trainings and we were doing training with a, he was a white um, CEO of an organization and he had done this um, email out. This was maybe the April, uh, no, May, June, 2020. So we're talking about the height of COVID. We still don't know what's happening and we're all very much in lockdown. And no, it was later than that then. It was later on in the year. And so he had said, so, Imagine we have a pandemic. We know that because of 
um, labor disparities. The essential workers are mostly black and brown and indigenous people. We know that because of health disparities and the nature of um, systemic racism, the people getting COVID, dying from COVID are disproportionately us. And so we know all of those things. And so I'm talking to this white CEO and he says, well, you know, we sent an email out and said to folks, you know, if you need a couple of days, we know you're having a difficult time. If you need a couple of days, you know, take a couple of days. And they got this massive backlash in response. And he was saying to me, we don't know what to do because the backlash is so overwhelming. There's so much rage and this, all this irrational emotion. We don't know what to do with it. So it is not that emotion is irrational, it's that the only context you have for emotion is whiteness. So the idea of, of, of reckoning what it is to be black in the middle of a pandemic, followed by police brutality and the murder of George Floyd, followed by protests, and the expectation that you continue to labor, even as you grieve, mm. as you are lost, as you are lonely, as you are hurting. I said, it's, it's, not, just in, it's not just inhumane. Your illiteracy to the humanity outside of yourself is breathtaking. It's breathtaking. And so it's not rage. You're, you're witnessing a human response. You just have no relationship to a humanity that is wrapped in melanin. You gonna learn today? <laughs> <laughs> so what if we replaced guilt with grace and what if we, we, we replaced grind with care? This is our work. Rest and replenishment has got to be the new black. I say that very specifically because it has to be about who black people are, black, who brown people are, who indigenous people are, to ourselves first and to each other that emotional justice is about a communal healing that transforms institutions, systems, and structures, and how we then move through them. And without, an, without the change that connects the two, without intersecting the, the, in the individual with the institutional, that is not a healing model that can work. So what I'm always clear about and say is I'm not a therapist, this is not therapy, that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm doing. It is absolutely healing that is specifically about structural change and structural transformation. And because it's about structure, it requires bigger stages than we've ever built and it requires us going into unknown spaces, not just unknown in the world, I mean unknown in terms of our relationship to ourselves. To go to a place where you prioritize rest and replenishment and make it your new specific space to go to in times of trouble is alien journeys. These are alien journeys. They're unfamiliar, they're uncomfortable, they're challenging. We're going to still police and litigate one another's choice to rest. Within all of that, we have to still find our way back to each other. So I'm going to close by saying, because I know my time is well and truly up. This is our mantra. Rest and replenishment is the new black. <laughs> Emotional justice is a roadmap for racial healing that I built through research and assignment and community over almost 15 years, multiple cities, multiple countries, multiple continents. Um, but it was born out of understanding and seeing the price we pay for a racial healing model that centers whiteness is nothing short of soul, physical, emotional, spiritual, and ancestral murder. Mm. We have been dying for too long, and a, a liberation and a healing that doesn't center our rest and replenishment is not a racial healing model. So I want to create a world where emotional justice is our new normal. Rest and replenishment is the new black. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. Um, you know, to really have, can you, can they hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, to really have done two back-to-back -back events with Trisha Hurst's new book coming into the world. I mean, these books are coming into the world in the same week. Right. I think that is um, divine providence in the universe doing its work and making way um, because black women really do provide liberatory frameworks. It's, it's what we do. That's what we do, people. Um, and so I'm really so grateful. We have, um, 
you know, you're my friend, but I just really can't wait to pretend you're not my friend and just dive, <laughs> <laughs> like, dive into this book. Like, seriously. Um, I want to, like, write it up and mark it up and hold it. See people nodding, like, for real, for real. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, is it, yes. I want to share what I'm working on that's very relevant to the topic, if that's okay. Uh, so it's not just a question. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very troubled emotionally because of the injustice in the world. I think it's partly because of my African background. I'm Algerian, and Algeria was colonized for 183 years, which was uh, a terrible time for Algeria that's still recovering from. But uh, just to get to the point, during the height of the George Floyd riots, um, I, I contacted the president of NYU, and I offered him a $500 donation to share a solution that I was working on for, to create economic justice because I don't believe you can get emotional justice without, like you said, systemic change that, that uh, improves the lives of brown, uh, black, and, and indigenous people. And the president just totally blew me off. And, and after the January 6th riots at Capitol Hill, I did the same, he blew me off again. So I submitted uh, this, this idea to create um, economic justice within minority communities especially to the Entrepreneur's Challenge, to the NYU startup competition. And they discriminated against me by not selecting you with three open slots, you have to go to all qualifications and putting uh, extra conditions for you not to participate in the future in any of their programs and services. And now I'm uh, pursuing NYU in the federal court. So my idea is 99% back then with 100% wealth redistribution model from the corporations to individuals built on a social network like Facebook. So imagine if Facebook was, was to share 99% of its profits to 99 different organizations that represent black and brown people especially. For example, the Equal Justice Initiative, which helps incarcerated people in the US, which are predominantly people of color, they get 1%. The NAACP gets 1%. So imagine a social network that's, that's growing, not by giving its equity to already wealthy shareholders who are mostly white men. Is anybody here a shareholder of Facebook? Probably not. So this uh, social network is, is looking to grow organically by sharing its profits, by leading with the a capitalism based on generosity and love, not on greed and self-interest. And this model is totally uh, incompatible with what the NYU Business School is teaching or, or capitalism today as we know it. So that's how, what I'm working on now. And there's some minor, minor uh, successes. For example, today I learned that this competition now has removed entry fees for students, because last year it was $25 and $100 for other people who are not students. But because that created the legal liability, which is what, partly what my case is about, it's actually you know, creating a, a bit of improvement, not only in my community, but hopefully, if this goes to trial, um, it will be a jury of New Yorkers deciding between a 99% corporate wealth redistribution model and the current system, which is you know, just serving the interests of a few individuals. And I don't think I'll ever be, ever be able to come to any emotional healing without seeing that the public cares enough, still cares enough to, to support a solution like this. And so far, I have to say, I've been disappointed by not having enough allies. Um, and you know, hopefully, from me sharing this, you know, some of you guys can talk to me about it afterwards and see if you guys would like to help and be allies in this struggle to create 99% wealth redistribution to mostly minority communities through 99 organizations. Um, and just one last thing, because you mentioned South Africa, if you don't mind me sharing. Uh, one, my first case study in terms of uh, allocating free 1% profits was the Trevor Noah Foundation, which is doing really good work in South African education. And um, their executive director, who's an NYU graduate, has accepted the 1% allocation. But she doesn't know that it's part of this bigger scheme to give away profits to get adoption and membership to create profits to give back to the people. Um, so I just wanted to share that, and I'm trying to push through this, um, you know, this, this movement like all alone at the moment, but if you guys want to be allies, that'd be great. And if you have any questions for me, and thank you again for coming to share. Thank you. I think one of the things that's really important when it comes to um, emotional justice and racial healing is to center the work of healing and of the framework without engaging or expanding or deflecting into something else no matter how worthy you may think it is, that the, the reality of emotional justice is it requires a, a presence when we're present and a focus on it specifically. Let's take another question. There's a question here in the front. Sure. Um, 
First off, I was fortunate enough to be at the Schomburg last night, so thank you. Um, I think I, I'm thinking a lot about taking up less space and also um, reconciling kind of what, how much is a threshold for the work to begin. Um, you know, so often everything's scale, everything's large, and so for, for kind of this sea change, um, how do we, how do you think about um, just the, the threshold and the kind of iterative small steps that you mentioned expanding into something that is expansive in the minds and hearts of the folks who embrace right. emotional justice? Right. So I think history is our lesson. History is our, very clearly our lesson in recognizing that um, a liberatory model started with people's choice to not be enslaved. So for me, it begins with building a framework. I don't know where the framework is going to land, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to build it. And then building an institute in order to um, ensure that when I say that I'm treating the emotional as structural, I do it in the work that I do, and then I engage from that space and from that space only. It will always be a, uh, an iterative process because the notion of scale when it comes to um, racial healing is dealing with the language of whiteness's structure that is so committed to protecting itself from anything that would dismantle it. And the truth is that one of the fastest ways to dismantle inequitable systems is when we as a global black people stop speaking the language of whiteness and engaging in a particular way, there is a dismantling that happens. We've never created major change through majority scale. It's always been critical mass. The, the story of our entire liberation as a people has been about critical mass. And that's how we move. And I think for me, that's instructive in remembering when you feel small and you work in a world that, that's reminding you that you're small, is that that is how we made history. Um, I think Joan was you were the person that says the visionaries don't get blueprints, they make them. We're making blueprints. And so the idea is that they're used and they're used again and again and again by the people who come along, the people who engage. Um, but if we start with thinking about scale, we'll be defeated because the, the sheer size of the obstacle that is white supremacy, which is designed to crush you at every turn, will crush you before you begin. But the story of our liberation has always been about critical mass doing extraordinary things because they're quite literally willing to imagine a world that we can't see. And that I think is part of what it means to be liberation literate. You're building the thing that you want. You can't see it, but you must build it. And so for me, that's real by, I don't do this work as an individual. I'm the CEO of an entire global institute that I built. I have a global team. I'm here in New York right now. Somebody in Ghana, somebody in Chicago. We have somebody in the UK. But it started as a me in South Africa watching the entire world media applaud black men willing to stand on the bodies of black women for this quote unquote healing. And I'm saying that's, the, that's what the legacy of untre untreated trauma will do. It will enable you to stand on each other and talk about it and call it and talk about a healing. But the other thing that was important to remember was it was um, predominantly black South African women who said, in the townships, we will sue your asses. We don't care how little we have, we will sue your asses because you're not doing this in our name. And I remember witnessing, you know, you have phalanxes of cameras. I remember them saying to Madame Biko, you know, the entire world is saying, forgive. You are, you're the only one who's saying, I don't forgive. And she's saying, I don't just not forgive. I'm going to sue your ass because I'm not doing it. One voice, but her voice helped me build this movement that's turned into this institute. That's how we've always made change. She's no longer with us. She doesn't know what was created, but, but for the ability and the, her courage to stand her ground, and I always remember that she took her son with her because she was saying to her son, you will not be who these, these men are. 
But the other thing that those, all of those black women said to the men, I will sue you, but I don't hate you. I'm just saying we ain't doing this shit this way. We cannot, there's no liberation here. There's no healing here. With Winnie Mandela, the primary reason they went after Winnie Mandela is she said to the people, you will not forgive them because you will teach your children to swallow a poison they will never be able to eradicate. So you can't do it. They took her onto every stage. Tutu literally begged her to say, all you have to do is say, you're sorry. And she sat in front of the entire global media and just said, I won't do it. I got to meet her and she got to share that story with me. She doesn't, she's dead. And I'm sitting here with an entire global institute as a direct result of what she did. That's how we've always built. And that should encourage and affirm us. Reverse racism is a form of healing? Well, it's a uh, practice. Do you think reverse racism exists and do you think it will be a form of great way of a form of healing? No. So reverse racism is not a thing to me. Um, I mean, so he, this, is, this is how I look at it in terms of emotional justice. That as a black people, as a people who has endured the kind of violence globally, systemically, at every single level, revenge is the most natural emotion to have when you've witnessed the extent of a people being brutalized. <coughs> it would be bizarre if you did not feel revenge, if you did not feel vengeful. I don't think it's true that black people are forgiving. I think that understanding that there is a political structure to forgiveness that centers whiteness, that deals with a legacy of trauma, is not the same thing as saying that somebody's forgiving. The other thing I want to clarify is that when I, talk about being forg when I talk about forgiveness and emotional justice, I'm very much talking about structures and not people's individual choices in their individual lives. And the reason that I say that is because what we have is this, this expectation of black forgiveness of white supremacist violence. It always goes one way. Um, Woody Mandela was forgiven nothing. And she literally was a liberation leader who, who there's an entire people that are free because of her. She was forgiven absolutely nothing. So part of what emotional justice does is to recognize that these emotions that people talking about, talk about, they're not universal. They've been racialized. And they've been racialized in order to enable people to target those bodies for violence. And so um, one of the things that the black women of South Africa taught um, me, one of the women said to me, asked me how I spell forgiveness. And I said, so how do you spell forgiveness? And she said, R-A-G-E, rage. That enables me to get up and keep moving. But it's part, of the, um, it's part of the natural course of working through a set of emotions that make you human. Part of the cancer of a racial healing model that's, that only goes to forgiveness and doesn't, doesn't, and doesn't make space for the very natural feelings of rage or anger. Worse still, it turns your rage into a marker and a description that punishes you in specific ways all of that reality is designed to maintain this notion of a racial healing model that always centers whiteness. And we have to divest from that in order for that to, to be. So I don't know if that answers your question, but for me, like reverse racism is not a, I don't know what that means, because it's not a thing. Esther, can you um, close this out by telling us how to get the book? Yes, <laughs> I want to know how to get the book. Um, so we can't take one more, so I saw somebody, oh no, we can't take one more question, I'm sorry. Um, so the book is here, it's in the back, and I'm going to be signing copies. I'd love to sign copies for you all. And you can get it at any independent bookstore. They have it at the NYU bookstore now. Um, you can get it online, of course. You've got to count, rack up those sales. Um, and don't just get a book, share a book with a friend. How long is and it another number friend. one on Amazon? Oh, that part. So we're, it's a number one new release on um, Amazon. It's actually been number one. It's now six and a half straight weeks. Do an <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I'm very proud of that. So, buy the book, buy the book, buy the book. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. 
So do they need to take this? Um,